Hello. So uh, I want to echo the idea of having uh, some kind of note-taking device. Uh, your phone or laptop works too. I hate paper. Uh, but some people love paper, so no offense if you like it. Uh, we're going to talk about... I need to project more. Can you hear me in the back? Barely. All right, I need to project more. All right, so we are going to be talking about data-driven marketing with WordPress and laying some foundations for that. If my clicker worked, hey, it did. Uh, all of my fonts look crazy on here because originally it was set for 16 by 9 and these projectors are not that, so enjoy the font show. Uh, that's me. Uh, I organize the Raleigh SEO Meetup. I also host a uh, WordPress help desk in Raleigh and I help businesses uh, build their WordPress websites at opsys.com. So we're going to go over some of the fundamentals of online marketing so that we have an idea of what we're going to talk about today, how to measure your success with online marketing, um, common goals, and uh, ways to connect those goals with KPI and ROI. We're also going to talk about how to avoid technical, common technical challenges and uh, some places to go for more information and guidance. So I've got some quick questions for you all. This is where you're going to need that note-taking device so you can answer these questions. What do you want people to do when they come to your website? Take a few seconds, jot down whatever that uh, number one thing is that you want people to do. And then uh, if anybody wants to holler them out, we can share a couple of them real quick. Anybody want to share with the crowd? In my case, I want them to follow my site because it's a blog, so they need to follow. Okay. You want them to follow your website? Yep. Wanted to buy something? Uh, do you have an e-commerce site? Uh, I, I work for an engine manufacturer. Engine manufacturing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so do they actually buy on the website? Uh, well, they, they, yeah, in some cases they do, and in other cases they find a distributor to handle their service. Okay. So there may be a multiple step process there. Yeah. Who else? Uh, Answer the call of action. Answer a call to action. Okay. So you're taking the content marketing stuff around here, I presume. Who else? Just throw some out. Make an appointment? Engage. Engage? Okay. Next one. Why do you want people to do that? So I'll get paid. <laughs> there we go. Now we're getting somewhere. So follow the website so that way you'll get paid. So uh, there's actually something else that you want people to do. Follow the website is the backup option. Return. Depends on your business model. You want them to return? Yeah, so that's why I want them to follow. So they don't yeah. Anybody else want to throw one out? Why you want them to do that? To become a member, uh, subscribed, uh, like per, per price, free tier, and membership program. So that's what to do. Why do you want them to do that? Um, so that they can enjoy the content. It can help them solve any problems in their lives. And um, of course, making money, helping people. All right. And how does this impact the bottom line of your business? This is what all of this is getting to. Oftentimes I hear from uh, potential clients that they want more followers on Facebook as an example. Last time I checked, you can't pay your rent with Facebook followers. So it all gets down to how does this impact the bottom line of your business and being clear on how you're building that model and how you're optimizing towards that goal. So we're going to measure success in order to figure out where we're going with this. Quick little example to show you what a dashboard could look like if you're measuring some goals. Uh, you can see the light blue line. This is organic search referrals. So you can see spikes and dips as people are coming in off of search engine optimization into this site. This is just some dummy data measured in single dollar values. I hope nobody's excited about earning six dollars. Um, but it's some, an example to show you without uh, having to violate anybody's privacy on the sites that I'm managing. Uh, direct typing. You've got uh, the green line there, so that's if somebody gets your URL, goes directly to the site, types it right into the browser. Um, depending on the different types of marketing campaigns that you're doing, you would expect different movements in these lines. So if you've just done a mailing campaign where you've sent a piece of actual physical mail to your target clients, you would expect to see a bump in direct typing 
coming into your website if that campaign was successful. If you just did a push with some content, somebody out here was talking about calls to action, so content marketing, and you've got that content to rank in Google, ranking is great, but if you've got no traffic coming in off of that, it doesn't matter. So you would expect to see some movement in these organic search referrals. And this particular graph is measuring goal completion. So if we get 100 people to come to the website because they found some content in Google and they don't do anything, those 100 people are worth exactly zero to that business. We got to have people actually doing something. So some common goals. Most of you guys, we got a few examples of uh, business models. I think just about everybody fits into one of these five categories here. So uh, real quick, does anybody have a business model that they're working that doesn't fit in one of these? No? All right. So we're going to connect business models with some goals on the other side. E-commerce. Just shout it out. Uh, what's the goal of e-commerce? Yes. There you go. That's an easy one. Uh, if you have a subscription business model, what's the goal on the other side? Subscribers. 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 Membership site? Lead generation? All right, you guys kind of have where this is going. Um, this is where you can get into those different pieces and that multi-tiered funnel that you're putting together where you have people subscribe to a mailing list and then eventually you're going to sell them a product or service. Uh, I think it was automotive equipment or, Engines, was that right? Yeah. Engines. So you may have social media followers and uh, subscribers on mailing lists, but ultimately you want to get them over to something where they're buying a product or service and you can do some backwards math to be able to figure out how much is one more subscriber on my mailing list worth. This connects goals to key performance indicators to a return on investment. One of the things that we always get asked, for those of us that are uh, digital marketing professionals, is how can you demonstrate the return on my investment here? If I give you $1,000 for this marketing campaign, how are you going to show me that you're putting money back in my bank account? And in order to do that, you've got to work out what is the value of another social media follower if that's what we're doing? What is the value of another email subscriber? And it's a rough estimate and it helps you to determine how good of a job you're doing connecting with your ideal audience. In some of the other sessions here you've heard people talk about speaking to your ideal audience. Um, the better you do at speaking to that exact audience, the uh, lower your costs will be per conversion and the higher your profits will be per conversion. So by measuring those things down to the per conversion level, you can see those last thousand people that we brought into our email list when we sent them out that campaign and they only converted at 10% uh, and normally we've been converting at 30%. Those last thousand people that we just brought in are not our ideal customers. How can we tweak that campaign to speak to our ideal customers? So from goals, being sales, subscriptions, memberships, leads, and influence, we can get the key performance indicator. E-commerce is a little bit easier for measuring some of these things out because the transaction happens right on the site. Um, not everybody has as easy a time as measuring these things. E-commerce has its own set of challenges. Measuring uh, the performance of their campaigns is not one of those. That's a lot easier for them. Subscribers, members. Subscribers, calls, emails for leads, depends on what type of leads those are coming in. I was speaking with somebody out in the hall about using call tracking. Um, so using that data to be able to capture how many leads you have coming in and then how many of those leads actually convert depending on where they're coming from. With that key performance indicator, you can then calculate an ROI. With sales, you can go directly to money. Uh, E-commerce having it a little bit easier there. Subscribers. Sales through messaging. So if you have a thousand people that are subscribed to your mailing list and you send them a message about a sponsor's product or an affiliate link or something of that nature, that's where you're going to capitalize on that audience or a message about an event that you're having or however you're selling something to that uh, mailing list. Over time as your mailing list grows, you can measure those conversion rates. You can also measure the conversion rates for specific products and be able to determine is that product resonating with my audience based on how likely they are to buy it? Um, or is my audience changing over time based on how they respond to an offer that I've made previously with a different set of my audience? Um, <clears throat> with members, sales of paid membership dues, uh, output of sales funnels with subscribers, 
and uh, sponsorships and ad revenues. A lot of businesses, yours maybe, you were talking about getting people to come and look at your website. That could be a, a business model that is uh, monetized through sponsorships or uh, ads along the sides. Um, so you're actually wanting to optimize for people to click on those ads. You want to get them to come to the website and you want to get them to keep coming back, but ultimately you want them to click on an ad and go away. And that's how you earn money. And I don't know if that's specifically yours, but you're nodding your head, so I'm going to go along with it. I'm right. Close? Close? Yeah, okay. Some of the ads up front and others Yeah. A lot of times it's a good idea to layer multiple different business models. So you may have one business model where you're getting people to view and click on ads, but then you have another piece where you get them to subscribe to your email list and you make different offers through that email list. So you have multiple pieces that create a virtuous cycle. So here's how we can calculate the ROI of various KPI. I'm having fun with these letters. Everybody, before you walked into this room, were you familiar with KPI? All right, anybody still at this point lost and doesn't know what I'm talking about with KPI? All right, I was just about to say if anybody's embarrassed, I'm going to just explain it anyway. <coughs> All right, so KPI is Key Performance Indicators. These are the numbers that we can actually measure in order to get an idea of whether or not our business is succeeding at the objectives that we want. ROI is Return on Investment. So if Somebody comes to you with a marketing campaign and says, hey, you give me $1,000, I'm going to do this marketing thing, and I'm going to get you sales on the other side. You want to see for that $1,000 that you spent on advertising, you got $5,000 that came in in sales, you subtract your costs, you're still ahead, hopefully. Depends on your margins. We're not going to get into all that math. But uh, if you need help with this, talk with an accountant, <laughs> and they'll help uh, break down some of these numbers for you. Um, and then KPI is where you can measure uh, things like subscribers to an email list that are not directly related to uh, a revenue number. So if we have uh, profit from sales, that uh, e-commerce business model, that's a direct relationship. Whatever profit you got from that sale, that's your return on investment. Email subscribers multiplied by a conversion rate. So if only 10% of your email subscribers buy a thing and you have 100 email subscribers, you can expect to sell 10 things multiplied by the profit for each of those things that you sell. If you make $100 on each of the things that you sell and you sell 10 of them, you made 1000 bucks by sending out an email. Not bad for clicking the send button, right? But you had a lot of work to build that email list. Uh, members. Lifetime, average lifetime value. This is an important distinction that a lot of people overlook. If you have a membership site and you spend $500 to get somebody to join your membership site that costs $49 a month, first month that sounds pretty stupid. Spending $500 to get someone to give you 50 bucks a month, you're losing money. But if they spend the next 10 years on that membership site paying $50 a month and you only spent $500 to get them in there, that's worth every penny. So you got to have an idea of how long are people going to stay on your uh, membership site. As we get further down, we've got some lifetime value kind of numbers as well. So uh, subscribing to your email list. If you have an educational bend to your site, you may expect that within uh, three years, somebody's going to go from being a uh, novice at whatever it is that you're teaching them to being an expert and move out of your mailing list because they already learned everything that you have to share. That might be the lifetime value of somebody being on your email subscription list. Um, you can use some of these numbers to be able to work backwards and figure out how much can I afford to pay for an ad to get a new person, to get a new subscriber, to get more visitors to my site. So I wanted to make this a little bit more concrete and lay out a little mathematical problem here to explain it to you. So we have a course that sells for $150. 10% of the people that receive the email will buy that course. 50% of the social followers become email subscribers, and 1% of the website visitors become email subscribers. So that math then works out that each and every sale brings in $100 in profit. We can expect to get $10 in profit from each person that subscribes to our email list. So if it costs us less than $10 to get a new email subscriber, we want to keep doing that. If it costs more than $10 to get a new email subscriber, we stop doing that. $5 expected profit for each social follower and $0.10 cents expected profit for each new visitor to the website. So if you're only making $0.10 cents for each new visitor to the website and you can do some SEO content and bring in another 1,000 visitors to your website, I didn't do the math in advance and I should have backed myself into a corner there. 
10 cents times 1,000? Anybody real quick want to throw out the number? 100. 100 bucks? All right. So you can spend 100 bucks on that piece of content. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, standing in front of an audience, uh, math becomes difficult. <laughs> Technical challenges. So Google estimates that it blacklists 10,000 websites daily. I heard another talk that was uh, this morning about uh, WooCommerce security. And they were talking about how uh, by showing the little uh, lock in the top of the browser that uh, this site is not secure, that has a significant impact on conversion rates for e-commerce websites. Well, imagine when it shows up in Google search results and it says right underneath it, this site is not uh, uh, secure. And then if that message sticks around for any length of time, Google says, OK, you guys aren't a serious business anymore. We're just going to take you out of Google and completely. They're pulling 10,000 sites a day because security is not being addressed properly. So you can avoid that by having strong passwords, doing backups. We all know this, right? Back up your site. Avoid excessive customizations. Uh, what was the number from the trivia yesterday? 55,000 or 65,000 plugins are available on WordPress. Some ridiculous number like that. Uh, I think all of us that build WordPress websites and manage them for other people have probably seen folks that try to install all of them. <laughs> That's a really good way to uh, end up with problems on your website. Just because there is a plugin doesn't mean it needs to be installed. Uh, use strong passwords. This may surprise you, but in 2018, only six or eight months ago, I got contacted by a client that said, hey, my website's down. It's been hacked. What's going on? I said, hey, give me the login information. I'll take a look. They call it out to me. The login password was P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D-1-2-3. And I said, I found the problem. <laughs> so that's just 2018. I didn't think that I still had to say this, but we do. <laughs> password is not a valid password. Uh, use strong passwords. Um, if you don't know what that is, Google it. There are countless articles written about defining strong passwords. Do not share accounts. I run into this still a lot, where you have one account and everybody in the organization uses the same login. Everybody doesn't have to be an admin. And do install updates. I grabbed this screenshot. Show of hands, anybody seen a number larger than 22 updates that needed to be done? A few of them? All right, yeah. about sharing the passwords in the organization. Let's say, for example, one person is the master of all accounts, but you only want to give an, someone administrative access to one of the accounts on a list of five for the company. So the company has five sites, but you want them to go to one only. They can't have access to the others. Okay. And that can be generated, I guess, from the admin panel. Are you running WordPress multi-site? Yeah. Right, okay. For the video, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. So the question was uh, asking about being able to give access to only one site. And immediately I was thinking, you must be running WordPress multi-site, because if you had five separate installations of WordPress, uh, this wouldn't even really come up as a question, because they'd each have separate users. Um, it has been a lot of years since I have set up a WordPress multi-site site, so I don't know if things have changed. But I presume that you can set an admin for an individual WordPress multi site. I'm getting a nod in the back, so it sounds like I'm right. Like a super user level yeah. and an administrator level and all the other levels. Yeah, so super user gets access to everything within the multi site. Yeah. All right. So, um, quick show of hands. Who here has a WordPress website that is not backed up? will admit it. All right. There's a couple people that, that's the equi okay. This is an important one. Thank you for reminding me. If your website is backed up and you do not know how to restore your website from the backup, your website is not backed up. Now who wants to raise their hand? <laughs> All right. We got a few more. So ZNet, ZDNet did a survey and this is not specific to WordPress websites, but 39% of US participants surveyed never back up their work. Given that that's never back up their work on their computer, and then we're talking about WordPress, it probably is similar 
And since only three people in the room were willing to raise their hand, there's a few liars here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where can you find support? This is what you have to know to be a WordPress developer. Probably a few more things, but uh, show of hands, who knows all the things on the board there? Yeah. All right. Not knows the words, knows how to do those things. OK. So about a third of the room. Not bad for a, a WordCamp conference. So if you don't know these things, you're probably going to have questions about at least these or probably a lot more things as well. Meetups, conferences, and the internet uh, are good places to go look for help. I gave you a little <laughs> short list of places to start. Your WordPress dashboard has an events section, and it lists things that are on the uh, meetup sites right there in your dashboard. So you can uh, recognize those. The WordPress help desk that I do gets a ton of people that said, oh, I was just working on my website, and I noticed this event. It's right around the corner. I signed up. So that's a great place to start. From there, you can go to Meetup directly because the dashboard only pulls in the ones that are official WordPress uh, Meetup events. And there are a lot of unofficial WordPress Meetup events. So go to meetup.com, type in WordPress, see what's in your area. WordCamp, I think everybody here has heard of that before. <laughs> uh, Make.wordpress.org. This is a great place to figure out the people that are making WordPress what different groups there are that are doing that, and how you can connect with them. Uh, show of hands, who here knows before I'm saying it right now, that there is a group of people that are actually building lesson plans for you to be able to teach WordPress that are part of the contributor group for WordPress? One person. All right, so that's news for everyone. Uh, there are a variety of support channels. There's uh, one of my favorites, the next one here, codex.wordpress.org. Anybody been to that? A few more people have been to that. So that's kind of like the, uh, it can be. <laughs> it can definitely be confusing if you're completely new to WordPress. The codex can definitely be confusing. However, if you are uh, a developer trying to learn how to create plugins and themes and such, that's a great place to go. One of my favorite things in the codex that I regularly send people to is the article on uh, child themes. As you start building out your website and you're trying to figure out what is a child theme, how does this work, the codex has a wonderful resource on that and it walks you through the manual process of creating a child theme. I look at it the same way that my statistics professor in college looked at matrix algebra. They felt that you should probably do this once by hand in order to appreciate what the calculator is doing. <laughs> and so I always recommend to folks to go and build a uh, child theme once by hand in order to appreciate what the uh, plugin that you can click one button and it creates your child theme for you, what it's actually doing. Now the reason for that is that as you continue to build things with your child theme, uh, you're going to want to know where that code is supposed to go, what files are supposed to be where, and by having done it once manually, you'll understand that better. That's a bit of a tangent, but bottom line, go take a look at make.wordpress.org, take a look at codex.wordpress.org, see what resources are available there, if, it, if only because you'll be able to know what to come back to. And then wordpress.tv, which is where that video is going. <laughs> And what are you going to do with this information? I mentioned having some paper out or some sort of note-taking device. Uh, everybody that's been to conferences before knows that this happens all the time. You come to an event, you spend all day learning from people, you leave here super jazzed and excited to do all the things that you just learned about. Two days later, you're busy with work and you don't have time for this. And all of that stuff that you were super excited about, nothing happens. This talk is not going to be one of those. If you make an accountability appointment with a person to whom you've committed, the likelihood of you completing that task goes up to 95%. So you're almost certainly going to get something done if you commit to doing it, tell someone to do it, that you're going to do it, and make an appointment to follow up. Here's what I want you to do for your accountability partner with that note-taking device. Now that you know all of this information that I just shared with you, what task will you be completing? Make sure it's measurable and realistic. When will this be done? 
set a specific date, not a week from now or, well, a week from now you could actually get the date, but sometime within the next six months is not specific. Uh, the end of May, that's specific. How do you want me to follow up with you? I'm going to give you my contact information. You're welcome to reach out to me. I will personally be your accountability partner. Let me know how you want me to follow up with you. If you don't want me to do it, contact your friend, uh, the keynote speaker, if you guys were here for that. Mentioned having a buddy that's going to uh, call you out on your BS. This is a great opportunity to use that buddy. <laughs> and if you need it, there's my email address at the top. Shoot me a message. Let me know what to ask you about, what day to do it. I will put something in my calendar. I will follow up with you about that. I will not sell you anything. And those are the things that I do. If you have any questions. No questions? We covered everything thoroughly. Oh, I saw a hand start to go up. Where do they live? Yeah, the slides live on, uh, oh, what's it? SlideShare on LinkedIn. Yep. And, uh, well, it's not all on here. My first name is Frank, middle initial C, last name Jones. So if you search SlideShare Frank C. Jones, you'll find it directly. Um, but do you recommend using uh, another uh, company for landing pages like ClickFunnels, or do you recommend doing that within WordPress? Um, <clears throat> so ClickFunnels is a cool platform. It gives you a WYSIWYG, uh, what you see is what you get, easy way to build those things. However, uh, you can also build those things with a variety of page builders. Um, Elementor I know is talked about uh, here. Um, I know that uh, Thrive Themes I've used many times before. Uh, WP Bakery, several folks have uh, talked about here. And that's just three off the top of my head. Um, essentially what uh, uh, lead pages and services like that are doing is creating a specific type of page called a squeeze page. And all that you need to do within WordPress is uh, create a blank page that doesn't have your header or your footer and then build the rest of that page around there. Um, there's tools within WordPress that allow you to do that without having to pay that ongoing monthly fee. Uh, so it depends on whether you need the ease of use or the lower cost. But you can solve the problem in multiple ways. On WordPress? Yeah. Any of the page builders will allow you to do that. Uh, Elementor was one of the ones that I mentioned. Thrive Themes, uh, WP Bakery. Anybody else know a Divi? Divi, yeah. Is this a squeeze page? Yeah, squeeze page is a particular type of landing page where essentially people have two choices. They can either do what it is that you're asking them to do, the call to action, or they can leave. They can't get lost in the blog or link out to your social media channels and never come back from Facebook. They can either do what it is that you're asking them to do, buy the product, subscribe for the email list, whatever, or they can click their back button and go do something else. So it's sque you're squeezing them to do something. Yes? I'm sorry? Uh, so. Is this only supposed to be about Facebook or anything else? So uh, the way that this connects with Facebook is that uh, you might have followers that are paying attention to your business on Facebook that then come over to your website and uh, interact with your business in some way. Uh, but they could come from anywhere. So it could be more than just Facebook. All right. What is your main service offering at Opsis? So I have been uh, working in conversion rate optimization. Uh, so that's me personally working with a variety of clients with that. With Opsys, I'm making the transition away from being frank that does work and become a business that has a team of people that solves a collection of problems. So uh, Opsys is focusing on WordPress management and building simple WordPress websites as a way to start having a conversation with clients and move into more advanced marketing services. Um, Yoast, like Yoast? As a, as a plugin versus um, SEO framework. I find Yoast. 
Um, Yoast is the one that I use on most of my sites. Keep forgetting to remind you. Could you for the video repeat the question? Sorry, I keep forgetting to repeat it. Uh, the question was, is Yoast uh, uh, favored uh, framework or uh, are others preferred, uh, given that Yoast uh, can slow things down a little bit? Um, so the first piece, I use Yoast on most of my sites. That being said, I am also uh, tinkering with uh, rank math. Is one that I have on one of my sites that I'm exploring with right now, just to see how that works out. Uh, the green light system, I also organize the Raleigh SEO meetup group. Um, so I use a variety of tools for search engine optimization that go beyond just Yoast. As a starter tool, it's really easy to sit somebody down and say, make all the lights green. So that's a huge feature for beginners. But aside from editing uh, meta titles and descriptions, I don't use most of the other features that are baked into Yoast. As far as the optimization piece goes, if you properly optimize WordPress, uh, the plugins don't bloat it as much. Um, I run uh, my sites on my own VPS servers that are optimized the way that I want them, and uh, uh, I can make them load fairly quickly. Uh, but if you're using a five or ten dollar a month hosting provider, you're going to run into some challenges there anyway. Uh, and I always like to recommend the right solution for the right stage of business. If you're new and you're just beginning, you don't need to deal with any of those optimization things that I'm talking about. Just stick Yoast in there, make the lights green, and prove your business model. Once you've moved beyond that, then we can optimize further with other things. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, what A-B testing do you use to see what works, what's working for conversions? So there are a variety of A-B testing. <laughs> yeah. uh, what A-B testing tools do I use? Uh, with the clients that I've worked with, I've used uh, a few different uh, A-B testing tools. Oftentimes, uh, Thrive Themes has some split testing tools that are plugins uh, that I've used with them. A um, couple of others that the names aren't coming to mind right now. But most of the time, we're dealing with what I like to refer to as business level statistics not academic level statistics. If you're an academic and you're looking at the math that we're doing here, you're gonna just laugh because we don't have anywhere near statistical relevance. But if I run an ad campaign and I've got two different Facebook ads, they've both been shown to 100 people, one of them's gotten me 50 clicks, the other one's gotten me two clicks, I don't need any software to tell me to turn off the one that got me two clicks and keep going with the one that got me 50 clicks, right? presuming clicks are the thing that I'm after as opposed to conversions. Um, if we are measuring conversions, uh, just to twist that example a little bit, if those two clicks both turned into a sale and the 50 people that clicked on the ad, nobody bought anything, I'm actually going to turn off the one that got 50 clicks and stick with the one that got two clicks that actually bought something. Does that make sense? Um, so it's, it's a, matter, a lot of it is very basic level math that you don't need software to do the heavy lifting. You just need to set up an experiment where you have test A and test B, and then let it run to where you have at least 50 or 100 or so. Uh, it depends on your market. For some people, 100 people might actually take weeks to get there. For other people, it might be hours. Um, so there's a lot of variables there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did I sufficiently answer? <laughs> OK. Any other questions? All right. Please, before you're done, uh, we would love your feedback. My talk rocks. Now let's give Frank a big hand. Thank you.